I'm going to speak on a very special subject today, and I'm saying this especially for you in the radio listening audience. You might want to call up and get this information. You know, people have often wondered why we celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December. I'm going to bring a message today and tell you why we celebrate Christ's birth or Christmas on the 25th day of December. And so I hope you'll get the message, you'll listen to what I have to say, and it can be very helpful. Take your Bible, turn to John chapter 10, page 1129 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I have four Bibles left. I have three, the regular size. I have one, the very large print of the original Schofield Reference Bible. Maybe some of you still wondering about giving a Bible to someone for Christmas. I only have four left. I can save you some financially on the Bibles if you're interested. Now this tape today will be tape number 361. I'm speaking on a very unusual subject today. Probably never heard a message on what I'm going to bring today. I'm going to bring a message on why we celebrate December the 25th for Christmas or why we say December the 25th is Christ's birthday. And I'm bringing a message on that. I want you in the radio listening audience to call your friends about it. I want you to listen carefully to what I have to say because this can be very, very helpful. While you're turning to John chapter 10, I want to say just a word about our books. You know, I have five books on Bible questions and answers everyone should know. 150 in each book. And on page three of book number one, you have these questions. Where does it speak of the sole of a dove's foot in the Bible? Who ate veal cooked by a witch? Who ate her own son? Who said, is there any taste in the white of an egg? What whole nation was made sick by a quail dunner? Who ate a little book and got indigestion? Who ate a book and found it sweet? What woman fell in love with young men from their portraits? What man was seduced by his daughter-in-law in disguise? What widow ate parched corn? What woman gave a man butter and then killed him? What blind man's funeral is described in the Bible? Or where was the first cemetery mentioned in the Bible? Who erected his own gravestone before he died? Who beheaded a man as he lay on his bed? Who said the worm shall feed sweetly upon him? And who fell off, off a seat and broke his neck? That's on page three of book number one. You'll find the answers. If you write in, request this book and send in a gift of $2 or more. We'll send it to you at your request. If you'd like to have all five, enclose a gift of $10 or more to be used in our radio expense. Now, I appreciate the most beautiful Christmas cards you're sending in. Very beautiful. You're thinking about us at this time of the year, and you can request this information in your Christmas card, save writing two letters, stamps are so high, no point in writing a letter and then a Christmas card if you want this information, a book, uh, just request it in your Christmas card if you plan to send one. And you pray for me and write to me. This is a faith ministry I depend upon you that love God to keep this program on the air to work with me in getting out the gospel. It is a home mission work. I want you to realize that and pray for me as we sojourn. Now this tape is number 361. You have this tape for a gift of $3 on the broadcast and you can request it by number 361 or you can say, Preach Edward, send me the tape on why we celebrate December the 25th as Christmas of Christ's birthday. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Reading from John chapter 10, page 1129, and beginning with verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I have told you, and you believe not. The works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe them not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. 
neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now I want you to look back at verses 22 and 3. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Here you find Jesus paying a visit here at this particular feast time, and this feast time is called the Feast of Dedication, and the Bible said it was winter time. It was winter at the time Jesus came here uh, to this temple for this a special feast in his lifetime. Now in order to understand something about why we celebrate December the 25th, you got to know something about the Jewish Hanukkah. Now this particular feast as the Jewish Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication. And you must keep that in mind. I explained to you a little about the time of Jewish Hanukkah. They observe that once a year like we observe Christmas, but not necessarily at the same time every year. Because the Jewish people use the Jewish calendar, which is a lunar calendar, it has to do with the moon. And we use the uh, solar capture, uh, calendar, which has to do with the sun. And we have 365 days in our calendar, and they have 360. Therefore, they have a leap month quite often. In order to catch up with the situation, we have a leap day. Now, Hanukkah has to do with this Jewish feast. Now, they observe this every year. You must keep that in mind. It's a feast of dedication. It's a feast of lights. It's not always been a feast of lights. And I'll explain to you uh, on the, in the message today as why it's not always been a feast of lights. Now about 323 B.C., a man by the name of Alexander the Great died. Now you've read about him. Uh, he, he spread his uh, Greek culture and philosophy and all over the, the Middle, U, Middle East. And he'd conquered the greater part of the world at that time. He spread the Greek culture known as the Hellenistic culture. And he spread that in the nations that he conquered. But he died and conquered just about all the known world. And he had no heir left in order to take over and uh, claim his uh, gains he had made in the world. So he had four generals and he divided his land among the four generals. There was one general that settled up in the north of Jerusalem in a place called Assyria. And of course he, he established the Seleucus dynasty up there. And that's north of Jerusalem. There was another general known as Ptolemaeus. And he settled down south of Jerusalem, down in the land of Egypt. And so these two kings, these two rulers, these leaders, of course, had many wars between them. And the people of, of Israel had their little providence between the two nations, Assyria in the north and Egypt down in the south. And so they were caught between the two. But we find in those days, according to history, that Israel... Uh, paid tribute to Egypt for a period of 100 years. And of course, they were mostly dominated by Egypt at that particular time. But they were divided. In the land of Israel there, they had two groups. They had the religious group that would lean toward Egypt. And then they had the other group there that would lean toward Assyria. That was the more aristocratic, aristocratic crowd, uh, aristocratic crowd there in the land of Egypt. And uh, they were a proud group of people, non-religious. They cared nothing about God or Jewish traditions. But you had the group divided there in the little land of Israel, some serving uh, uh, Egypt and some serving Assyria. And then there was a man there in the land of Assyria by the name of um, Antichus Epiphanes. Antichus Antichus, whichever way you want to pronounce it, uh, and Pippanes there in the land of Syria was a ruler in Syria. So he goes down in the land of Egypt and he conquers Egypt. And then he had to hurry back home to consolidate some things there at home. And then come back to consolidate his victories down in the land of Egypt. So Antiochus of Pippanes, after going back to Assyria, he goes back down into the land of Egypt. And while he had gone down there to consolidate his victories in the land of Egypt, Rome became afraid and jealous of his movements, 
afraid that if he gained uh, victory there in Egypt entirely and in the land of Israel, he becomes strong and they'll have problems. So the Senate in Rome sent down a committee and they intercepted him down there in the land of Egypt and told him, orders from Rome has come that you are to get out of Egypt and get out immediately and get back north to Assyria. Of course, he didn't like that. Antiochus Epiphanes hated God. He worshiped false gods out of the land of Assyria. And he didn't like it, but he had to go back anyway. But on the way back, he thought, I'll pass through Israel, and then I will sway them to remain loyal to the Assyrian government and pay taxes to us. And then it might be that if Egypt decided to try to conquer us, it'd be a good uh, buffer zone between us. And so he goes back to Israel and begins to talk with the people there in Israel. And then while he was there, he went into the temple and he took his, well, his, told his soldiers, he said, I want you to sacrifice a pig there on the altar. And there Antiochus Epiphanes had his soldiers to sacrifice a pig on the altar in the temple there in Jerusalem. Now the temple was a very sacred place, of course, and according to the uh, Mosaic economy, they were not allowed to have pigs there in the land of Israel. It's an abomination. Uh, but he, anyway, he wanted to sacrifice that pig on the altar. Then, of course, the people there, the Israelites there in the land of Israel that leaned toward Assyria, they cared less whether they sacrificed the pig on the altar or not. And so they sacrificed that pig on the altar. And then after they did that, they did something even worse. There he put an image or statue of his god, Zeus Olympius, on the inside of the Holy of Holies. Now you must remember when Nebuchadnezzar went in and captured Jerusalem and there carried the Israelites captive into Babylon, that the glory of God had left the temple. The glory of God was not in the temple at the time that Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed the pig, or uh, put a statue or an image of his God, Zeus Olympus, there in the Holy of Holies. Had the glory of God been in there, God would have struck them dead. But the glory of God was not in the temple, not in the Holy of Holies, it had not been there uh, from about uh, until uh, when Nebuchadnezzar came in about uh, uh, 586 B.C. and there carried them into Babylon. And so he saw that work well. He wanted to win over all the Israelites. He knew he must please those that leaned toward the Assyrian room. And when he did that, he said to his soldiers, I want you to go around these villages and we're going to sacrifice a pig on the altar where these Jews worship in their villages. And so they went to a little village called Modin, about um, 15 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And there they had an altar where the Jews worshiped. And uh, Epiphanes told his soldier, I want you there to sacrifice a pig on that altar. And he got one of the Jews that cared nothing about God that uh, wanted, of course, to be approved of by the Assyrians. And the soldier said to him, you sacrifice that pig on this altar here. And when that apostate Jew took the pig and started to sacrifice on the altar, that was a man by the name of Matthias. And he had five sons. One of them was called Judas the Hammer, the oldest one. And when he started toward the altar with that pig, there Matthias killed him. And they killed this Jew that was to sacrifice the pig. And when he did that, of course, um, we find Matthias and his five sons. They out, uh, uh, attacked the Assyrian soldiers and killed many of them. But they knew they'd be reprisal time and time again. So we find Matthias and his sons and the people that live in that uh, community, in that little village. They went back into the wilderness and there started a guerrilla warfare. Now, of course, they, had, they killed many of those Assyrian soldiers, but they knew there'd be a reprisal, and so they go back, and they fight a guerrilla warfare for three years. From about um, 188 BC, 168 BC to 165 BC, there they fought a guerrilla warfare. Now, it was 168 BC when Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed the pig on the altar. And they fought for three years, and eventually they drove out the Assyrians. And the Assyrians went back, uh, of course, to their own country out of the land of Israel. 
Well, when the Assyrians went back into their own land, then we find that Matthias and, and his sons and others went to the temple. And they went in there to cleanse the temple. And for three years, the abomination of desolation was there in the temple. It was desolate because of the abomination. Jesus made mention of that in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. He mentioned the abomination of desolation, which is also a type of the coming of Christ, what he'll do when he enters the temple. And so they went back, and for three years it had been desolate. God was not there that offered that pig on the altar and put that image of Zeus Olympus in the Holy of Holies. God had left the place. But after three years, on the 25th of December, now you get this, on the 25th day of December, they went in and cleansed that temple. Now exactly three years to the day from the time of Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed the hog on the altar. Now the reason he sacrificed the hog on the altar, that was a heathen holiday. December the 25th was a heathen holiday, and that's why Epiphanes sacrificed the hog on that particular day. It didn't matter with him. He said, let a flow go with the crowd. It's a heathen holiday. Sacrifice the hog on the altar. It was three years exactly to the day when Matthias and the people went in to cleanse the temple, and they cleaned the temple up, and then they rededicated that temple, and lo and behold, they rededicated that temple on the same day, December the 25th. On December the 25th, they dedicated that temple, so you keep that in mind. And then, of course, we find that time rolls on, and then about 200 years later, there's a man uh, that wrote Jewish history, uh, Flavius Josephus. He wrote Jewish history. He was a general there in Israel. But when Rome came in, he capitulated because he saw they were going to be conquered. So he leaves and he goes to Rome. And they joins up with the Roman people. But he wrote a history. And of course, you get much of the information about what happened in those days from his writings, the antiquities of the Jews. Josephus wrote that. But before that particular time, during the intertestament period of time between Malachi and Matthew, there's a period of time about 400 years. And that was known at the time of the writing of the Maccabees. Now, 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees, you'll find in the book of the Apocrypha, but they're not inspired, but they're in some of the old Bibles. Not in spite of God, but they're there. And in the book of 1st and 2nd Maccabees, they write the story of what Antiochus did in offering that sow on the altar, that pig on the altar. They have that in their writings. It's history. And they have the very date that he went in and sacrificed that hog on the altar. It is there. And then, then they have the very date that the, the temple was uh, there cleansed on the same date on December the 25th. But there's nothing, nothing said about lights. Now the, the Hanukkah today, the Jewish Hanukkah, they celebrate lights. It's a dedication of lights. They place in their window nine lights, nine branches. The, of course, they represent eight days. The Hanukkah is eight days long. And in the window of the Jewish home, you see those nine lights, nine branches. They're in the window. Uh, they're letting you know they're celebrating Hanukkah. And they do that for eight days. But you find nothing about lights back then. The lights didn't come till later. They celebrated Hanukkah, but without any lights. About 200 years after 70 AD, after Titus the Great destroyed Jerusalem, we find that Josephus wrote about what they found in that temple when they went back there to dedicate and cleanse the temple. These Jews went in to cleanse the temple, and they had to have a light in that temple in order to do so because they couldn't see in there without a light and they needed a light. And in order to have a light in the temple, they had to have a light, had a flask of light. Uh, uh, they found one flask of light, but they had to have a light in there. And that oil in that light had to be dedicated and provided by a priest that dedicated to God. So they went into the temple and one flask of light only burns 24 hours and they found only one. And so according to Josephus' historian, they lit that one candle, that one light. Instead of that one light burning 24 hours, it burned for eight days, and they cleansed the temple. Now, he's the first one that mentioned the light. 
I want you to keep that in mind. The light, that's very significant. The light, he mentioned that light. And so today you see on the branches of the Hanukkah candles in the Jewish home, you'll see the lights. And of course, there's a real meaning to that. Now, why 200 years later did he mention the light? Now, let's get back to what happened when Jesus came on the scene. When Jesus came on the scene, we find in John chapter 8 that the Jews brought a woman to Jesus there to try to trick him, not that they cared for the woman or what she did or Moses' law, but they said, we have a woman here that's taken in adultery, and we caught her in the very act thereof. Now Moses in the law said she's to be stoned to death. Now what do you got to say about it? The Bible said Jesus reached down and he wrote in the sand. And then he stood up, and you know what he said to the woman, it's in the scripture, but there in the, in the context, you'll find there that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. There you have the Son of God making reference to the light. I am the light of the world. In other words, he's saying to those men, I know I know what you have done. I know your past life. I'm the light of the world. I know. And there he wrote in the sand before he made that statement. Then when you come to John uh, chapter 9, you'll find there a man born blind. He had never seen light. And Jesus touched his eyes and that man saw light. There he saw for the first time. Keep in mind the light. And I'm talking about the light. There they saw light. And he saw light, rather. And then you come to John chapter 11. You find a man dead. And if a man is dead, to be sure, he can see no light. And Jesus raised him out of the grave. His name was Lazarus. And he saw the light, of course, when he was brought alive again. But in between these chapters, you find John chapter 10, where the Bible says Jesus walked there in the temple on the temple poets. And the Bible said it was winter. It was winter time. And there you have where the Jews started their, their uh, Hanukkah, celebrating of their Hanukkah. They didn't necessarily start it there, but Jesus honored the celebration of their Hanukkah, uh, the time of dedication. Now they were celebrating the dedication, the time when they rededicated that temple on December the 25th. And Jesus honored that. He honored that by being there, his presence was there, and he was the light of the world. And so later on, now I guess this, this is very important. Now the temple was cleansed on the 25th day of December. We find later on, of course, let me back up and say this, the, uh, the pig was offered on the altar also on the 25th day of December. The temple was cleansed on the 25th day of December. December in, in 325 A.D. Now you get this. In 325 A.D., after death of Christ, a church council met. That church council met for our spiritual business and religious business and, and so forth. And the subject was brought up. They said, uh, by the way, uh, when was Jesus born? Nobody knew. You have no record that tells you when Jesus was born. And they began to discuss that. They said that is so important at the time of his birth when he came into the world. That is so important. We'd like to know. Nobody could find out. Josephus didn't tell us in his history. Nobody, the Maccabees didn't say in about the time he was coming when they wrote. And nobody knew. Nobody knew when Jesus was born. And so the council back there in 325 A.D., 325 years after Christ, they set a date. They said, why don't we just go ahead and set the date December the 25th? The temple was dedicated on December the 25th. The temple was cleansed on December the 25th. And if a temple was cleansed on December the 25th and dedicated, then why don't we go ahead and set the date, December the 25th, to be the birth of Jesus? And of course, this is the argument, the strategy for this. Now they said that uh, in the temple, the glory of God came, the deity of God came and dwelled in the temple. Whenever God's glory came in the Holy of Holies in the temple, there was a deity of God in the Holy of Holies. 
And when they dedicate that temple, that happened on December the 25th. And then they said, if God's deity came into the temple and God housed his deity in the temple on December the 25th, why can't we say then that God housed his deity in a human body on December the 25th? They said that sounds reasonable. We, uh, we just go ahead and say, well, that God sent his glory and God placed his deity in a body on December the 25th. And of course, it had reference to the time when Christ was born on December the 25th. They said, let's set that date because that's the time when God's glory, when God's deity came down to mankind and there they lived in a body upon the earth. And so they set that date and the date for Christmas was set in 325 A.D., uh, 325 years after Jesus Christ our Lord's time upon the earth. And from that time until now, uh, it's been celebrated on December the 25th. Now they didn't set that date because um, uh, the time they offered the, the pig on the altar, that was a heathen holiday. Now you must remember December the 25th was a heathen holiday before the cleansing of the temple when they offered that pig. That was a heathen holiday. That was the beginning of the occasion of what happened on December the 25th. Now they didn't set the date of the birth of Jesus on December the 25th because it was a time of the dedication of the temple. That was a holy day and a precious day, but that was not the real reason they were doing that on December the 25th. The real reason they set, it, set the date of December the 25th to be the birth of Jesus is because that's the time whenever in the temple, the temple housed the deity of God. When they cleansed that temple, God's deity came back. God's power came back. God's glory came back. It hadn't been there since the days of Nebuchadnezzar. They built a temple after that, but God's glory was not there. God's glory came back when they rededicated that temple. And so they re rededicated the temple, and God's glory came. They said, now, if God's deity came on that day, then why didn't God's deity come when Jesus came, was born of a virgin uh, that was deity housed in a human body, why not December the 25th? So in, in 325 AD, the church council, the church council in that day met, and they were religious people from surrounding countries, and they met and discussed and argued pro and con, and they set the date for the birth of Jesus on 325 AD. You may say, preach Edwards, you think that was time he was born? I don't know. And they really don't know. Nobody knew the date. They didn't know the date. Nobody knows the date. God hid that date for a, a, a specific reason. Now they set that date because of why I told you they set that date. And from that time until now, it's been December the 25th as Christmas or the birth of Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to the dedication, which is called Hanukkah, the dedication of lights or the dedication of the temple. Now the Jews do that every year. They have their Hanukkah lights, and that, of course, is remind them of the dedicating of that temple back there uh, whenever they went in and cleansed the temple and rededicated the temple after the altar, after three years of desolation and the pig had been offered on the altar, three years was in darkness and after they drove the Syrians out, they rededicated. And that's why the Jews have their Hanukkah every year because they're celebrating that particular time when they went in, cleansed the temple. As Josephus said, they found one little flack of oil that should have lasted only 24 hours, lasted eight days, that cleansed the temple and God's glory came back in. Now in the uh, Jewish uh, lights, of course, you have there, you have nine lights uh, upon the little branch of nine lights. And they have one light in the middle taller than the other lights. They have the middle light taller and that's called the, the servant light. And then they have four lights on either side. On the first night of the Jewish Hanukkah, there they light that tall light. That's called the service light. And they'll light that light. And then the next night, they'll take that light and light another night. And the next night, they'll light another candle. And the next light, uh, night they light another candle. 
and the next night to light another candle until they have all eight candles lit, including the service light, which made nine. Now that service light there, of course, for us today, is a type of Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world, and he's the light that lighteth mankind everywhere. Those other candles were lit from the service light. Now, humanity today is, is lit from Jesus Christ. I would, you know, turn in your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, will you please? And let me point out a verse of Scripture that's very important at this particular time. A verse of Scripture in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. I want you to look at verse 9. That was a true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus is the true light. He's that middle light. He's that servant light that lights the other candles. And of course, that produces the nine lights. He's the light that lit you and made you alive in Christ Jesus. Now, that's why at Christmas time, you have lights. Now, it wouldn't be Christmas if we didn't see many beautiful lights. As you drive up and down the highways and pass by the homes, you see the people dedicating their home, decorating their homes rather, with beautiful, beautiful lights. Now you must remember back whenever they dedicated the temple and cleansed it, there's no light mentioned. There's no light mentioned until 200 years later when Josephus mentioned that candle and from the mission, uh, that flack of oil rather, in the temple. And uh, from that came the, the Hanukkah. From that the Jews of course have their nine lights. Now we have Christmas all lit up with Christmas lights. And all of that springs back or comes back from the Hanukkah or the lighting of the candles by the Jews whenever they celebrate the dedication of the temple. That's where our lights came from. And Christmas time is a beautiful time of the year. December the 25th started as a heathen, as a heathen day. And then uh, when they dedicated the temple and cleansed it, of course, that happened on December the 25th. And of course, God's glory came back in the temple. And then later in 325 AD, there they chose December the 25th to be the birthday of Jesus or Christmas time. And from these things, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He's the light of the world. He said, I am the light. And of course, he is the light. And from that, we have our Christmas lights. Whenever we string Christmas lights in our homes, where we place them, they should represent Jesus being the light of the world. What kind of Christmas would you have without lights? Christmas time is a beautiful time of the year. It's a time to celebrate the birth of Jesus. It's time to celebrate him as the light of the world. And Christmas time should make everybody feel good and thrill their hearts. It comes at a time of the year in the cold winter time when everything seems to be dead and then Christmas time just livens people up and then gets you ready to start into the new year. Nothing wrong in Christmas if it's served in the right way. You can't overdo it. You can make a God out of it, and you can uh, cause problems at that particular time of the year. But it should be a time of joy. It should be a time of dedication. It should be a time of lights. And without lights, it wouldn't seem to be Christmas. Can you conceive of this nation uh, serving Christmas, not one Christmas light seen anywhere? Any, no, no. That would be darkness. But because of the lights, because he was the light of the world, then we have our Christmas lights. Nothing wrong in celebrating Christmas. You have cults today that, that's against celebrating Christmas, the Russellites and others, but they are so in spiritual darkness they don't know what it's all about in the first place. And you have other people that oppose Christmas time. But there's nothing wrong in having and celebrating Christmas, providing you do it in the right way, in the right manner, and do it to glorify God. Now I've told you today how, why, and when the 25th of December was set aside as Christ's birthday or Christmas time. So you keep that in mind. You can get this tape for a gift of $3. You ought to re-listen to it, learn what you can about it, and God will bless you as you do so. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. May your name be ordered. May Jesus be glorified and always say to you, 
We thank you that Christ was born. We thank you he's the light of the world. We thank you the fact of rededication. We thank you, God, for every blessing. At this particular time of the year, as we see the lights, we know he is the light of the world. And want to praise you for it. We thank the beauty of the lights we see in homes and villages and cities. Lord, we thank you for them. They remind us that he is the light of the world. And help us to realize that as we sojourn. But thank you most of all that his body house deity, when he came to the earth the day he was born. And we thank you for that birth in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Debbie, you play us a couple of stanzas. And while she's playing, if you need to come forward for any reason, I want you to come. God is speaking to your heart. If God is speaking to you about any matter and you feel like you should come forward, you ought to do it. 